uh, now we have the last lecture on gravitational waves uh, by uh, Franz Pritzker. Yes, please. Um, OK, thank you. And actually, it's not going to be on gravitational waves. <laughs> um, well, in a sense, it will be, because I'm going to be talking about these Kasner solutions, which, if you will, are big universe-sized gravitational waves. But that's not really the <clears throat> sort of the, the, the emphasis. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, approaching the big crunch in cyclic bouncing uh, cosmologies. Let me just mention, uh, I'll just show you some of the, the references if you want more information. So there, of course, as you can imagine, like in an hour, hour 15 minutes, I'm not going to be able to go into too much detail about essentially any of this. But if you're interested in more um, details, here's some references, some general references. Um, this is certainly not exhaustive. There are many of you articles that have been written, but here are a few uh, good examples. And then on some of the more technical things that I will be talking about and some of the animations that I'll show, it's coming from these papers. And so, uh, <clears throat> so I don't know, I'll, I guess the, the slides will be ma made available, right? So people don't have to scribble this down. They can, um, they can look at that uh, afterwards. Okay, so let me stop sharing for now because most I'm going to be on, on the blackboard and then I'll show a few animations and results from example cases. Okay, so the, the, I guess the motivation for this, this lecture is these cyclic or bouncing alternatives to, to inflation. Now, I guess inflation is sort of the, the main paradigm today for what, what might explain you know, the observable universe on large scales, so at least solve um, what Classically, you know, the, the homogeneity, isotropy problems, uh, causality issues, etc. Um, I'm not going to go sort of into details about, you know, what might be issues with inflation as some people see it, or what might be problems with these bouncy cosmologies. I mean, that's, that's not a debate that I'm actually qualified to speak on. I'm not a cosmologist. I sort of dabble in a little bit of this sort of on the side with some of these uh, bouncing cosmologies. Um, but what I will sort of ex what I want to, so the, the main takeaway, the two takeaway messages that I want to, um, that I'll hopefully explain and, and, and give to you in this lecture is, um, if, if there is a pre-bang phase to the universe, um, it can be an alternative to, to inflation, or perhaps you know, there could be some inflation, but there might be a pre-big bang phase where the universe was contracting. Um, and in the phase before the bounce, whether it's a singular bounce or a non-singular bounce, so at, at that phase, you need non-standard physics. It's got to be a correction to Einstein gravity or some um, novel kind of, of, of uh, matter. But before you get to that, if Einstein gravity is, is valid, there's a big problem um, with Einstein gravity, and that's uh, space-time is unstable to uh, anisotropy, and actually wildly unstable. It develops... It evolves perhaps maximally far away from homogeneous isotropic space times. You get the so-called chaotic mixed master dynamics. So what I'm going to spend most of the time, I'm going to say, I'll go a little bit again over the Friedman equation, illustrate how anisotropy shows up um, and why it's a problem. Um, you can sort of, you know, even though the, the, the full dynamics is very complicated, um, some aspects of the Einstein equation simplify sufficiently that you can actually get a very good, um, almost quantitative understanding of the so-called chaotic mixed band dynamics by looking at uh, some very particular solutions. And in particular, the one um, that's most relevant is the so-called Kasner metric. So I'll explain the Kasner metric. Um, and, and then for the sort of the solution to this problem, or one solution. So again, if, if there is a contracting phase to the universe, you don't want this and isotropy to essentially completely derail that contracting phase, you need to deal with this issue. Um, and with these um, so-called you know, ekpyrotic models that um, you know, Neil Turok, Paul Steinhardt, and collaborators um, developed, I think, almost 20 years ago now, um, one solution to this problem was by adding a scalar field with a very steep negative potential. And then, so I'll illustrate then the perturbative calculations um, that mostly done by Anna E.S. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I, I should know. She's one of my collaborators. But I, I always, it's, is it E.S. or E.S.? But in any case, Anna was the one that did this perturbative calculation. So I'll outline um, the perturbative calculations and show how this, this kind of scalar field can actually cure this anisotropy problem. 
Okay, so, so uh, for those of you who, who know about Kasner, BKL, these bouncing cosmologies, etc., I apologize, this is going to be a very boring talk. Um, if you've never seen this, um, you know, hopefully you'll get something interesting out of it with these, uh, uh, these by understanding the, the, these uh, metrics. Okay, but let, let's just start with um, the, the homogeneous isotropic case, the, the, the Friedman-Robertson-Walker line element. So if the universe can be described on large scales by a spatially homogeneous isotropic metric, you know, this is uh, one of the usual sort of standard ways of writing it. Okay, so here we have, I guess, co-moving coordinates. Is that my phone wants to join? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it's a, the, the scale factor, A of T, this K, this constant, this represents spatial curvature. This is just the two, the, the, the uh, unit two sphere metric. So the standard form for the uh, FR, FRW, FRLW, however, they'll, you know, however you want to call this, um, the, the Friedman metrics. So in, in general relativity, the Einstein equations, essentially this is the only degree of freedom that's posited with so this ANSATS, and the Einstein equations then tell how this evolves driven by matter. Um, and in fact, you know, with, with sort of, okay, with, with such a symmetric space time, there are no gravitational wave degrees of freedom, so it's really all driven by matter. So the Einstein field equations give the Friedman equation. Again, I'm sure you all are quite familiar with this. Um, I'm probably misspelling Friedman. You know, yesterday in my talk, I misspelled several of the names, and Thibaut pointed it out afterwards. I, <laughs> I won't mention which ones I misspelled, but I'm pretty bad at that, so Friedman might be misspelled. But so. This is, so the fractional change in the, the scale factor with respect to time is the Hubble function. So that's squared. I'm using geometric units, so G and C is equal to one. But then this is then governed by the, the matter content of the universe. And as to illustrate, I'm gonna add sort of three, sorry, two fluid components, um, sort of a pressureless dust if for, you know, regular matter, radiation model, there's a fluid, um, and then a scalar field, which, you know, a scalar field doesn't gen generically behave like a fluid, but on one of these homogeneous and isotropic backgrounds, you can think of it as a fluid with an effective equation of state. So these rho sub m naught, rho sub r naught, rho sub phi naught is just some fiducial initial value. And of course, this tells how the energy densities in these various components scale with the scale factor of the universe. And, okay, the scalar field scales like this. The curvature contribution goes like one over a squared. Okay. And so for a scalar field, this effective equation of state parameter, uh, W, you know, is, um, this particular quantity. So V of phi is the, the potential for the, the scalar field. Okay, so we can think of it as a fluid you know, with this effective equation of state. Um, of course, it doesn't have to be a constant. And again, if you go away from isotropy, homogeneity, it also generically does not necessarily have to behave like a fluid, but here you can think of it as such. Okay, so, so the nice thing about this equation, again, this is something I'm sure everyone here is, is familiar with, is um, it very clearly shows you how the various components scale um, with a scale factor. And therefore, as you know, if the universe is expanding, if A is increasing, you get the various epochs where, you know, so in an expanding universe, of course, the, 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 the largest power of A dominates furthest in time, as didn't so radiation dominates first, but eventually matter is going to take over. Um, if there is spatial curvature, that will eventually take over, and of course that's that's a big problem. And so, of course, because um, you know, if there is spatial curvature, even a small, relatively small amount, that will either cause the universe to recollapse, 
very quickly or expand very quickly depending on the sign, um, which is not good for, for conditions of life. Um, and so, of course, that's a one, to one thing, like in an expanding universe, to sort of cure this, you need some form of matter effectively that, that scales um, slower than this as the scale factor increases. So, for example, inflation is one way of doing it where you add a scalar field where this omega is effectively negative one. And so this essentially becomes like a cosmological constant. And you can get a De Sitter-like expansion period, and this will dominate. OK, so um, you know, and incidentally, of course, now but we're, we're going to be thinking about um, sort of applying this um, to a, a bouncing cosmology. So we're not, not actually going to look at the bounce. We'll just mention a couple of things about this. But we're, so we can imagine, for example, what's called a singular bounce is if, if the scale factor actually goes to zero at the, at the bounce. And of course, if, if it goes to zero, there's actually a curvature singularity. And then you need some quantum gravity magic one to, to figure out what's going through there. Um, but what people have been studying a lot more recently are so-called non-singular bounces, where the scale factor actually doesn't go to, go to zero. You still need exotic physics at this point, um, either modified gravity um, or some again, modified matter, because the Einstein equations don't bounce by themselves. But one reason why people are sort of looking at these kinds of models is you, you can make this bounce ab above the Planck scale, and then you can argue, well, you don't really need the full machinery of quantum gravity. It can just be some exotic scalar field or a relatively simple modification to GR2 to engineer this non-singular bounce. But so yeah, so again, we're going to be sort of focusing on this area with the scale factors decreasing. And so this kind of understanding what's happening from the Friedman equation based on the various powers of A that the, the matter components scale to, that's kind of flipped around compared to an expanding universe. Franz, and so off, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so isn't the theta global the theta an example of a bounce without, without exotic matter? Yeah, if, if, you, if you want to consider a cosmological constant non-exotic matter. So yes, that, that, that is actually one example. Yeah. Um, OK, so, so the... This, the slight difference here, or perhaps a big difference, when you want to sort of take intuition from this equation going from an, expand, an expanding situation to a contracting situation is the, 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 the relative importance of the powers flips around. So of course, as, if this is becoming smaller, um, the largest powers are the ones that are important. And so if just for example, in a contracting universe, um, curvature is usually not a problem, as opposed to an, an expanding universe um, relative to these other components. Okay, so okay, so now what, what are the sort of the, the problems with having is imagining a scenario like this? Well, again, as I mentioned, one is um, you need to violate some aspect of gravity, and it's sometimes most um, commonly um, explained as you need to violate the null energy condition. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, so this, this thing can be set up, uh, can this be set up like if I have, if I set up A dot to be negative? Yeah. Get on C, then this kind of thing will happen here? Yeah, so, so, so here um, A dot is negative. Oh. Sorry, A is negative. <laughs> So, but a, a double dot is, positive. yeah. And see, if you set up More. A dot to be negative, uh, you're giving this thing to it. So it can't be something like this. So this will go down, and this is everything is constant. Um, I think that it might be like what you were asking. But if you just have a cosmological constant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't catch it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but actually, so let me, let me start. So, the, so the, just to, to show this, so the, the second Friedman equation, and actually in, 
you know, this is kind of redundant with the first, but it, it's essentially using, well, it's actually more illustrative, but if we, if we write down what the, so the second derivative of this is, it's given by this, this particular combination. Okay. And so, you know, for this to happen, you know, the second derivative has to be positive. So this, whatever, whatever, however you do to make that satisfied, if you want something like this, this has to be uh, positive. Okay. And so that, that, that implies that like rho plus 3p must be negative. And that, that violates, sort of by definition, <laughs> this being positive is a null energy condition, so this violates a null energy condition. Right, so to, to get, you know, well, to get a balance, singular or non-singular, you must violate the null energy condition. Okay. Okay, so that, that, that's definitely, well, okay, it's, a, okay, if, if it's a problem, but, you know, okay, if we want to explain the universe, sort of, you know, like, you know in inflation, you need an inflaton, you need some non-standard physics as well. Here, you also need some non-standard physics, and that, that's one of the features that it has to have. But, okay, what, what's perhaps, in another sense, was actually more problematic, or even before you get to this point, all right, so let, let's just look at this regime where we assume just pure Einstein gravity is a valid description. So before any novel physics kicks in, we have the problem of anisotropy that we have to deal with, and that's just from Einstein gravity. So let me explain that. So anisotropy doesn't fit in the exact Friedman equations. That's okay. Um, yeah, for all. Okay, good. So, of course, this, this is a homogeneous isotropic universe, so there is no anisotropy, right? But usually the way you can sort of see what, where anisotropy might be problematic is if you look at small perturbations um, about the Friedman uh, space-time. And then for, at the small, so let me, let me sort of put this in a box, so this is looking for perturbations, whereas this is, you know, this is the exact, exact for homogeneous and isotropic. And then the effect of this anisotropy, uh, which is proportional to the shear of the flow, and I'll, I'll when, when, when we look at the perturbations, I'll sort of define this more precisely. Um, but this is essentially the shear squared, some quantity representing energy effectively in the shear squared. And it scales like 1 over a to the sixth. So again, in a contracting universe, it's the largest powers of a that dominate the dynamics. And so if there is some shear perturbation, some anisotropic perturbation, it's going to dominate as you approach this, this bounce or this crunch. And the problem is that, you know, say it's, it's not, again, it's not like this is just another effective matter component. And you can say, okay, what does this do when this term dominates? This is not consistent with a homogeneous isotropic space-time. And so if this starts to grow, eventually um, this Friedman, th this n set is going to become worse and worse. And the Friedman equation is at some point not going to even describe even remotely what's going on. So... If this, if this term dominates, it takes uh, the solution to a completely different class of space-times. So it's, it's, it's a real problem. It's not just like another matter component with different scaling. It's really uh, an instability of essentially these class of space-times in a contracting phase uh, of the universe. Though, of course, the opposite, if you're in an expanding phase, if there's some anisotropy, then it's, it, it's, it's stable. It, it decays away. It's not relevant. So it's... it's that's really just a problem in a contracting universe. Okay. Um, and of course, yeah, just keep, you know, asking questions. This is, this is more a, a lecture. It's not a, a talk. Um, okay, so... Okay, so, so, so what happens when this... 
this term starts to dominate. Um, and as I mentioned, at least in words, what, what, what happens with the space-time is a so-called chaotic mixed master dynamic sets in. <laughs> so the chaotic is actual chaos, sort of, you know, in a, the usual definition. A mixed master, so apparently it was Charles Misner that came up with this, with this word. So he, he studied this, uh, this a lot. And the mix master was those old KitchenAid mixing machines, right? So like you, you put your universe in, you make it in batter form, you put in the mix master and it just, it mixes everything up. So that's where the mix master comes from. But essentially what happens is that the space-time dynamics becomes what's called ultra-local. And it's, it's not very easy to define it um, in any kind of precise way, but effectively from the Einstein equation, so now you, you've got to, you've got to look at the full metric, all the degrees of freedom. But kind of remarkably, as you approach, you know, this big crunch in Einstein gravity, so in Einstein gravity, there's, there's no bounce. This isn't, you know, we're not worrying about the violation. But as you, as you are in a contracting universe, uh, the spatial gradients in the field equations, in a, in a well-chosen coordinate system approaching the bounce, of course, there's not a coordinate invariant statement, but in a well-chosen coordinate system, spatial gradients become irrelevant. And essentially, at every point in space-time, effectively the field equations become a set of uh, ODEs that you have to solve, ordinary differential equations. Um, the gradients are important in that they influence those ordinary differential equations, but sort of one point in space-time doesn't really talk to another point in space-time. Um, so each point of space-time sort of behaves independently. Each point in space-time, at least for these periods, approaches a Kasner metric, which is one of these anisotropic vacuum solutions, which I'll describe next. So I'll show you explicitly what the Kasner solution looks like. But the Kasner solution itself is unstable, and it undergoes these so-called bounces. So not to be confused with this bounce, but these little Kasner bounces, where it bounces from one Kasner solution to a different solution, and it does these bounces in a chaotic fashion. And so each point in space-time is doing these kind of chaotic bounces, um, and because of the ultra-locality, essentially independently of each other, and you get this incredible sort of rich singular structure that forms that's about as far from homogeneous and isotropic as you can imagine. So it's really a, a disastrous thing if you want to you know, have a universe that's is kind of remotely like ours. Unless, of course, you know, perhaps it happens quantum gravity comes in and changes everything. You, know, you can, you can wa wave a, a magic quantum gravity wand to change this, but if you, if you don't want to do that, if this, if this is supposed to have some imprint or some relevance to what we observe today, you have to avoid this, this Kasner-like behavior. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. So do the matter fees play any role in this phase? Um, yes and no. So what I'll, what I'll show now, the actual Kasner solution is a vacuum solution. Um, and certain kinds of matter can play a role. Um, in particular, scalar fields can, so, so sort of radiation, the, these, these matter fields don't, they, they become irrelevant. But if you, if you have a scalar field without a potential, um, this actually then will have effectively W equals one. Yeah, sorry, I erased it there, but then it's just phi dot over phi dot. And so this, this kind of scales in the same way. So a, mass, a, a, a potential a scalar field can have some interaction. And then we'll see the key to, to solve this problem. If we have a, sne, a steep negative uh, potential, then this W, if it's greater than one, then it can actually dominate. And then it, so then, depending on exactly, there, there can be an interplay where you've kind of have got a mixed matter Kasner solution. But if you make this W sufficiently large, then it will dominate. But so, so the answer is, for most matter fields, no, but some matter fields, yes. And the, the, the ultra-locality holds true also for those? Yeah, that that's, it seems to right. So then, so then and yeah, that, that, that's actually the, I forgot to say it, but the other takeaway point sort of at the end of this is that actually suggests that, you know, or, you know, well, this is just an example of another mechanism um, to solve this problem of causality, you know that you know if you look at the CMB, you know those points are causally disconnected, yet they're in the same state, and so the and, and it's a thermal state. So we usually think, okay, well, what's one? What does a thermal state imply? It means they were in causal contact at some point. 
so, so, so this problem of all the little, little patches on the sky being out of um, causal contact sufficiently far in the past, kind of the way, I guess, sort of very colloquially our inflation solves that it says, well, okay, no, thermal physics says they were in causal contact at some point, and so let's do something which, which makes them all be in contact. With this kind of ultralocality, the, the, these distinct points never had to have been in causal contact, but what makes, what drives everything to the same state is there's essentially a universal dynamical attractor. So when you start adding these fields, every point, even though they never talk to each other, they're driven to the same, to the same state as you approach this, this balance point. So yeah, I, perhaps that'll be clear when I, when I show this stuff, but I think that's another sort of an interesting thing to keep in mind, that you know, having everything look the same doesn't necessarily imply thermodynamic equilibrium if you have some dynamical mechanism like this. But yes, with a matter field that the ultralocality does, does survive. Okay, so let me, let me write down the Kasner solution. So this is now, again, so the, so the, the full space-time, it's not homogeneous, it's not isotropic, it's got lots of structure. But because of this ultralocality, we can sort of analyze at least one phase of this mixed master dynamics using this, this um, exact vacuum solution, the Kasner metric. Okay. So again, this is in, like usual, there are many ways in coordinate systems in which you can write this. I'm just using this, this co-moving one um, with this particular time slicing. So it's sort of Cartesian-like coordinates. This P1, P2, and P3 are constants. Okay, so this is, an, again, this is a vacuum solution. So again, if there is matter, this is, a, this is valid, or it's approximately valid if the matter dominates. So if it's, if it's now, if this instability has taken over to a point where now the rest of the matter is irrelevant, um, to a good approximation, we can use this exact vacuum solution. So, so the Einstein equations in this case reduce to a couple of simple algebraic constraints on these three constants. So there, there are two of them. One is essentially that they lie on this plane. So the sum of these constants have to be one, and the sum of the squares of the constants have to be one. So they also sit in a unit, on a unit three sphere. So basically, the, you can pick these constants. Um, again, they're not arbitrary. You pick these constants such that it lies at the intersection of this, this three plane with this three sphere. So there's really one independent parameter. So this is essentially a one parameter family of solutions, but it's kind of more convenient to write it in terms of these three parameters. And the Einstein field equations then reduce to these, these two constraints. Um, incidentally, if you pick one of these constants to be exactly one, you can satisfy these by having the other two be exactly zero. But that's a special case. Um, as we'll see, it's got no curvature, so it's a, it's a flat solution. So it's just actually Minkowski space-time in a weird coordinate system. So except for, the, except for that special case, the, these um, space-times do have curvature. I mean, and I, <laughs> I was asked to prepare ex, uh, questions and exercises, but sorry, I, I didn't have time. So the exercises are derive everything that I write down here. <laughs> okay. so, um, and then, so okay, with a solution to the, the, the Kretschmann scalar to show that there is curvature, so the Riemann tensor squared evaluates to, and here I, to simplify the form of the expression, I've, I've used these two constraints to eliminate P1 and P2, but you can, you can do it, you can keep them all in, but I think this just does it a little bit more simply. P3 squared over t to the 4, and you know, to, to, set, to, to get a solution after substituting in. Okay. 
So P3 is between negative a third and one. Okay, so again, you can see, okay, P3 is one. That's a special case where there's no curvature. But in general, there is curvature. It, it goes, so T is negative here, approaching the singularity. The singularity is at T equals zero, so there's a curvature singularity at the, at the equivalent of this thing's big crunch. Okay. Um, now, you know, I, 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 I can't imagine you know, what this thing looks like in my mind, you know, a three-sphere and a two-sphere. But if you just kind of stare at these conditions long enough, or perhaps you can imagine, um, you can convince yourself that generically, um, two of the P's have to be positive and one negative. And that, that's where, where this kind of sort of maximally uh, anisotropic qualitative feature comes in. Because what that implies is that so as t, if t is going towards zero in a contracting universe, that means two of the dimensions, along two of the dimensions, space-time is contracting. But along one, the other one, space-time is expanding. Right? So it's not just that, that that sort of space is a little bit anis anisotropic. I mean, it's you know, two directions are contracting while one is expanding. Um, and that, that's also like, if you will look at it, you know, you know, gravitational waves have this sort of stretching, stretching, squeezing properties, and so this is kind of like a big universe full of gravitational waves. So this is this is the gravitational wave part of this lecture. Yeah. So is this formula invariant under permutation of p one, p two, p three? Yeah. Um, yeah. If you you could have picked any one, um, I think yeah. I, I, I think it's well. I think so. Um, yeah. Exercise show that it is. <laughs> um, I mean, if you, if you just if you take this metric, you compute this. Yeah, all of the p's are going to show up because you'll get the general expression. But then you can use those constraints to to simplify it a bit. Um, yeah. It's not. I just I just picked it for for example, right? Just for for okay, for simplicity. Writing P, sort of solving for, for P1 and P2 as functions of P3. But it's not special at all, right? And yet, like, which is X, Y, and Z, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I don't, I'm trying to remember if, if there was something about the positive. No, yeah, so actually, it can be positive or negative. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. What can be the origin of this analysis of the So, for example, like at, at the perturbative level, so if you start with the Friedman equations, uh, it can just be a little bit of anisotropy in matter. For example, you can just have uh, essentially a little bit of shear in the matter field. Um, and then that will grow, and eventually that will dominate. Um, and and it's essentially, yeah, it's, yeah, because it, it's an instability. So it's just you know, so there's anisotropy in this room, right? We 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 create a little bit of anisotropy. So it, it can just take an infinitesimal seed, and eventually it will uh, it will it will dominate. And uh, interestingly, the. Um, this is also probably, to some extent, what happens inside of a black hole. So, you, you know, you can form a black hole from the, the Schwarzschild metric. Is a, you know, it's 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 some spherically symmetric, so it looks like a very nice singularity that you can study. But probably, if you perturb things in a regime, you're going to get this kind of behavior. You're going to get this BKL. Well, this is a conjecture. This is one of these open questions. We don't really know what's happening in the interior of a black hole, but at least there's a regime where probably you've got this chaotic mixed master. And it's also because, you just, like a star is. Um, you know, mostly spherical, like okay, it's rotating, but any small perturbation will eventually cause this behavior to dominate. Okay, so, so perhaps yeah, to to write this in terms of of shear, which is kind of what what this is as well. We can um, so so the. So the, the congruence of time-like observers, sort of the co-moving observers. I'm using NA for them. And in this matrix, it's just 
you know, they, they're just moving in time. Um, and actually, so again, so two of the directions are contracting, one's expanding. And just, but if you compute the overall expansion, so the, the equivalent of the Hubble um, parameter, so we take the divergence of this, let's call it the expansion, it turns out just to be one over T. Right. So overall, okay, the two dimensions are contracting, one's expanding, but on overall, the expansion, actually, the, sorry, the overall contraction is just this, this pretty simple form. There's actually no, no dependence on the P's. Um, but the shear, we can write this, the shear tensor. So again, so to take this as our congruence, you know, you can compute you know, the, the expansion, the shear, et cetera, all the, this thing has no twist, but uh, so the shear is just the, the trace-free symmetric gradient of the, of the flow. The, the, the expansion is the traceful part of it, so we take the gradient of the flow. You will get these observers from calling it a flow, but you take the gradient of it, that's the expansion. You take the, the trace-free part, um, that's the shear. So this, so this is the, the, the spatial covariant derivative, this capital D. This is the four-dimensional covariant derivative for the space-time. This D is the, the spatial covariant derivative associated with the spatial coordinates, or if you will, the projection of the, the four-dimensional covariant derivative onto this, the spatial surface. I'm using D, this little capital D, D symbol for that. So this is the gradient, just the spatial gradient, and we subtract um, the expansion. And this, I'm using this HIJ for the spatial metric. It's a spatial three metric. So in this case, it's just this, just the spatial three metric. So with this, this definition, um, the shear tensor is a diagonal metric in these coordinates that takes this form. So this sigma i j. So I'm, okay, so, sorry, I mean, this a is running over all four space-time indices. This i and j is just uh, the spatial indices. So... This is a three by three uh, matrix, and it happens to be diagonal in this case. And it's the x component is two to the p one minus t to the two p minus one over three times three p one minus one. So the x x component and the the others are unsurprisingly exactly the same, but now with the other. And uh, here I haven't substituted any in conditions, so you can just see what it looks like. Okay. Okay, so, so here, to, again, just, well, from here it's obvious that this is uh, anisot anisotropic, but here actually explicitly computing the shear of this, this normal vector flow. And of course, in these coordinates, it looks like a very simple vector field. But because of the space-time, it does have an expansion, it does have a shear, and this is the shear tensor, this diagonal um, metric, yeah. Uh, so, and the important thing about how fast the direction is contracting or expanding is in C, right? Sorry, say again, is? Uh, and the important thing about how fast the direction is contracting or expanding is in C when we put it to C. Yeah. So, wh why does uh, C not come in overall expansion? Because I mean, it's independent of C. It, it, it essentially, when you put in these conditions, so it, actually if, if, you, if you're explicitly computing this metric, if you didn't put in, I think it'll be P1 plus P2 plus P3, I, I forget exactly, but so yeah, I have substituted in, I've simplified it using that. The, the, this one I haven't, but yeah, so. Okay, so that's a good point. So using the Einstein field equations, let's call it these two. Okay. There's a question in the chat. Uh, okay. So uh, it's asking, could you please explain the behavior of P1, P2, P3 as T goes to zero? Uh, so and then why does one of the three need to be positive? Sorry, so that, again, so, but, so, so P1, turns out that these are all, for a given Kessler solution, these are constants. So they don't, they don't change with time with the exact case of solution. So they're constants. 
And these, these conditions come from, from this, this, these two constraints. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of, I don't have a good geometric picture to sort of show this, but you know, if you can visualize you know, a three sphere. So this, this, this first constraint is that you can pick these things to be whatever you want as long as they're on a three sphere. But then also it has to interact, intersect this plane in three dimensions. And so if you take these two conditions together, you will find that this, that, that this effectively comes up. So they, they, they can't all be positive, for example. They can't all be negative because of these two conditions. So. Thank you. I have, an, I have a question myself. Yeah. Uh, so if I want to think of it as something that is happening near the singularity of black hole, T must be negative, right? Going to zero. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so in, in, with this quarter, we're approaching it with T being negative, yeah. OK. Um, right, and so, to, okay, so for example, in a, in a black hole, um, you know, if you write the usual Schwarzschild things with a T and an R coordinate, once you cross the horizon, R actually becomes a time-like coordinate. And R going, and going towards the future in time, R is going negative. So R is flowing towards zero. So R is positive and it's flowing towards zero. So that is positive time. So, so yeah, so here we are thinking of T as being negative, but in, in a black hole, similarly, you will have the, you can write then, change from an R to a T because now that's time-like and it will also be, it will be going to zero as well. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. How am I doing on time? Um, got about a half an hour. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, Okay. so, so th this is the Kastner space-time. Um, this, again, it's an exact solution. But as I mentioned before, it actually, this is also an unstable uh, space-time, space if, you, if you perturb it. So this is a homogeneous solution. But if you introduce inhomogeneities, um, then this is unstable. Um, and that's what then triggers a sort of chaotic uh, mixed master dynamics. I'm trying to think, should I? Um, show an example. Okay, I'll, let, me, let, me, let me just show one example of what happens in sort of a, a general uh, space time, just as an illustration. Um, and then later we can ex explain it a little bit better. But okay, so. Okay. Okay. So here's a, a simulation from a. Let me okay, let me write down what I'm plotting here. So what I, this is a, a, a simulation. It's a, I think it's a shared screen. Oh. Okay. So we. Okay, well, let me just write down this definition so I'll show you exactly what I'm showing. Okay, so this, this is the shear tensor. A useful invariant um, in one of these contracting space times is the following, which I'll call curly S. It's defined to be. And this. this So I'm taking the three copies of the, to the cube of the shear essentially, and these particular contractions to give a scalar, and then normalizing it by the overall expansion. Um, so this it turns out for for Kasner, this actually turns out to be, and yeah, I'm not substituting in the various things, but it's just pretty, pretty simple. Expression. So, 
So if you're in a particular Kessner space-time, um, okay, okay, this will be good exercise to show that in Kessner, this thing goes between minus six and six. Okay, it's, it's simple. It's, it's, okay, when you apply these constraints, it turns out that this can only go, it's between negative and six and six. So of course, you know, the shear is blowing up, you know, depending on these, as you go to zero or um, going to, to, so it is blowing up, but we factor out the overall blow up by dividing by the, the expansion, and then we just get a constant. So this is just a normalized quantity, and it goes between negative six and six. So what I'm going to show in, in this case, this is a simulation of a universe with one spatial symmetry. So imagine we, we've, we've said, okay, things are symmetric in the z direction, so it's not quite this, the Kazan solution, but we've allowed things to vary in x and y. And so this is a simulation done with David Garfinkel. Um, and we've introduced variations, and we've just made it periodic in x and y. So it's a sort of a toroidal topology. And this is showing this quantity, you know, with a color scale going from negative 6 to 6. Um, just so, to, so you can see, like, each point, the color sort of tells you which one of these Kasner-like space times is approximating each one of these points. So again, this is not Kasner, but because of the ultralocality, each point um, is going to, for at least for a while, very closely follow one of these Kasner space times. It's going to be a particular color that it goes to. But then you see there's going to be other, there's going to be more complicated dynamics because now, um, there is uh, inhomogeneity that's causing this, the instability of Kessler to trigger. Um, and, and sorry, and so here just T is actually going positive. The T is going towards the singularity. This, this T is not that T. It's just, a, it's just an infinite animation. Okay, so now, so we start the evolution, and now you're going to start to see there's sort of a first bounce where it goes to a different, the point, the, the various points are going towards different Kasners. There's another bounce that's happening. There's actually these so-called spiky structures that kind of fail to bounce. And these are Kasner-like bounces. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh. Uh, how does this go like? Just, just keep it for Ah, uh, uh, okay. Okay. So, okay, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just pointing at the, okay, at various, so, so, you, so you can, Okay, let me, let me play this again. But okay, let me first explain this, this final, it's not even the final state. So in these coordinates, the, the singularity is actually going to be, sorry. In, <laughs> oh. oh, so now I've started editing my thing. Oops. Okay. Okay, so in these coordinates, the singularity happens at t equals infinity. So in, in some sense, we haven't gone very far. And so, so in th this coordinate, this t, you start at some finite value here, it's going to go to zero in finite proper time as measured by one of these normal observers. So this is proper time for some normal observer. Here, in, effectively, this t is slowing down as you approach the singularity. So it's sort of stretching out a finite amount of proper time into infinity. So this is just a very small part of the evolution. Um, and so okay, now we're approaching it. So each point is sitting close to a Kasner but the instability is being triggered, so okay, I wouldn't point it, just the colors are changing. Um, there's another one of these so-called Kasner bounces. So every time there's a sort of a change in color, it's going from one Kasner-like solution to the next. And you can see this, this very sort of complicated structure is developing, but it's, we're only at like T of 45. <laughs> we still have infinity to go. So this, 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 this kind of structure is just going to get ever more complicated. It's going to form on ever smaller scales here. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say that a little bit um, in more detail in a, in a bit. But essentially, what happens is, um, so if we go as a let's say the okay, case. So now we're we you know in going time. So the singularity is here. So we're flowing in this direction, whether it's to t equals zero or to t equals infinity. So what it turns out is that there, sort of, there'll be an epoch. Well, forget if it's called an epoch or an era. There is a, there's a technical term for one of these Kasner epochs or eras. So one point here for a while will have, um, say, let's call this A. It will have a set of 
these P3, P1, P2, Cs are described. But so it will be contracting in a couple of directions, expanding in one with particular rates set by this. Then there will be a transition, which I'm calling a bounce, and it's also what's used in this literature. So it's called a bounce. It's not the big bounce. It's one of these little transitions. And so it will bounce now to a different set. Let's call it two sub B, right? And so that, that's when, when, when the color is changing, then it's going through one of these little bounces. But between, between those things, to a very good approximation, at any point where the color is constant, it's in one of these Kastner space times. So there's actually not black here. I think it's, it's, it's an artifact of the visualization. But the, these very sharp features, sorry, me. OK, let me try to do it. So some of these very sharp features that form, they're so-called spikes. And they're actually points that, it's a sort of its ultra locality. So, uh, so let, let's, say, let's say, for example, OK, this is right. So let's say at this point versus that point. So I'm looking at on either side of this, this central spike-like structure. Um, so I'm going, to be, I'm going to be pointing it to the people in Zoom. I'm just going to be pointing to the left or the right of that structure. But say at the left of the structure, there were a set of Ps. To the right, there were a set of Ps. And at least in this terms of the shear squared, they were similar. Um, there's a field that controls the instability. So a there's a gravitational perturbation. Um, and if, if I get time towards the end, you know, I might run out of time. But... Um, I'll sort of explain that's growing, it's growing exponentially. So there's, there's a gravitational perturbation which is growing. So here it's, it's very close to Kazza. That thing is growing. When that thing becomes large, it triggers a bounce. Um, but at these places where these, what look like black lines, that field has a zero. And so there's, because of the ultra locality, there's this, this exact line where that unstable field is exactly zero, so it's not going to trigger a bounce. So the, the space-time on adjacent signs undergo these Kasner bounces, but these lines fail to bounce. And so these lines that fail to bounce form these spike-like structures. Um, and then with sort of, and why this sort of repeated mesh or this, this ever-increasingly complicated mesh develops is this is going to happen forever. Um, in, in terms of proper time t, so the frequency is going to be increasing. So it's going to be so these little these little Kasner bounces are going to start happening faster and faster. There'll be infinitely many of them um, before, and you're going to get this infinitely or this I don't know this chaotic fractal-like structure in the curvature as you go to t equals zero. Um, yeah. yeah. So you said there's a bounce in between same signs. Yeah. Sorry. So 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 the all all three p's change. Okay. So they so here. So in this regime, uh, the metric is not well approximated by Kasner. It's a, you, need, you need a more general class of solution. And actually, I mean, this has been worked out in a lot of detail. Um, and there's, there, there, actually, there are maps that tell you, you know, given one particular Kasner that you're in, after the bounce, what are the new, the new ones? And this is, it's, you know, in, 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 it's in a sort of a Hamiltonian way of looking at it. Um, there are effectively these potential walls where you've got trajectories um, where in a Kasner epoch you're sort of going in a in sort of one direction, you hit one of these walls and it's like a, a you bounce like a billiard ball. So this is also called cosmic billiards. So each space-time point is just bouncing in this confining box, and each time it hits a box wall, these three flip around based on essentially some on a billiard table, <laughs> a cosmic billiard table. Uh, can I? Yeah. So would this happen if you started from uniform piece in the whole thing? But your initial yeah, so condition seems to be already not, not constant uniform piece. Yeah, so if, if we had exactly uniform piece, no perturbations, we'd, we'd stay in Kazan, in one Kazan. The bounces wouldn't happen. So we need, we need some perturbation. What you're saying is unstable. So Kazan is, un yeah, Kazan is unstable. Um, so in, as soon as you seed it with a little, with a small one of these perturbations, it will start this, um, this, this bouncing. How do you look for each perturbation? So, so in this case, this is pure vacuum, so it's a metric perturbation. Um, so if, if you will, 
um, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a, uh, a gravitational wave, if you will, um, that we, we superpose on. on the, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's actually, it's actually, this is not, the initial conditions for this is actually pretty far from, from Kasner. So the initial data, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a general vacuum metric, but then it very quickly evolves to one of these where locally each is Kasner. But you know, we could have started with something which was very close to Kasner and added a small perturbation. But then the thing is, this is also a pretty com uh, expensive simulation. So if we had a small perturbation, it would take a long time before this started. So we also wanted to start closer to this, this final dynamics. But yeah, in principle, just a small perturbation is good enough. Okay, so yeah, we've got 15 minutes left. So let me, um, let me now just very quickly then outline. Okay, let, let, let's m m mention the solution and then the sort of the perturbative linear analysis. So I'll show you some examples of full nonlinear simulations with now a smoothing scale of field that, that, that kind of cures this. But to sort of, I guess, get a, perhaps a, a deeper understanding, it's, it's useful to look at a perturbative analysis. And again, as I mentioned, this is what Anna Eas did. Um, so I'll just outline the calculation and then the details you can look, look in that paper. But so now, um, okay, so first, okay, so to cure, to cure this, so sort of we can add a scalar field with a very steep negative potential. Oh, so, yes. And sort of one example is one of these so-called, I guess they used to be called these aquarotic potentials. So if we have, so a negative, so just a constant times, uh, I shouldn't have called it K. This is not curvature. Let me, let me, let me call it C. No, that's not speed of light. Okay, this, this is not curvature. This is just a constant K. A constant V and a constant K. Don't, don't confuse it with curvature. So here, this is one example, a negative exponential um, um, potential. And this actually has a, there's a scaling solution that, that gives you an effective equation of state. So this is that W parameter in the Friedman equation. So when I wrote out the Friedman equation for the scalar field, it turns out you get that just from the, from the definition and um, with a scaling solution, there is some time dependence. Okay, perhaps as an exercise, find the scaling solution and show that this is the case. Um, and so therefore, if k is greater than square root 6, then omega is going to be greater than 1. And this scalar field will have a more significant contribution in the Friedman equation. So now, not, not, not Kasner, but now if we small perturbations of Friedman, in principle, this, this can dominate. Of course, just that it dominates in the Friedman equation doesn't mean that it's going to fix the problem. But it's got the, it's got the possibility that it can, because now it's going to be energetically the dominant contribution. And it turns out that it actually does. Um, it does prevent this chaotic mixed mass behavior from setting in. And so to, to see this, you know, it's useful to look at um, perturbation. So let me just very quickly outline this. So, um, so we're going to look at the Einstein equations in a contracting universe, and we're going to start with sort of an ansatz for the, the background that's sufficiently general that we can include the, the Friedman-Robertson-Walker matrix, the Kasner solutions, um, sort of as background solutions, and we can perturb around all of them. So, so okay, we're looking at the Einstein field equations. And in this particular case, sort of the tetrad formulation. So we're going to project things onto an orthonormal tetrad. Um, and we're going to do so-called Hubble normalization. And Hubble normalization is just taking every, t every sort of either field equation, you know, tetrad component, matter component, anything that you do. Because we've been interacting in a contracting universe, things are typically blowing up. But they're all typically blowing up at certain powers of the Hubble, of this Hubble parameter. 
So just like this s variable that I had just erased here, we divided it by you know, theta cubed. That's what Hubble normalization is. So you just divide every term by, by the appropriate power of, uh, of h or theta in this case, such, such that you get um, a term that you, you scale out the, 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 the rate at which it blows up. So that's what, that's what we, the Hubble normalization is. And it turns out, so now we've got you know, almost all, all the metric degrees of freedom. And now that we're out of an FRLW type universe, now they actually are gravitational wave degrees of freedom. And it turns out the Friedman equation is actually the Hamiltonian constraint equation. So it's actually not a dynamical equation in general. And the, what was the Friedman equation just turns out to be, just we write it simply kind of in these Hubble normalized variables in this particular form. So this is the energy density that's coming from whatever matter fields there might be. This is the energy density that's coming from the shear. And this is energy density that's coming from sort of curvature terms. So there's no, there's no constant k. This is actually a very messy expression. But essentially, we define matter, we define shear, and everything else we throw into what we call curvature. Um, and, and then, yeah, then look at the Einstein equations. Linearize about, linearize. about an appropriate background that includes sort of you know, the Friedman, Robertson, Walker, and Kasner as special cases. I mean, look at the, the, the perturbations where all metric degrees of freedom and matter degrees of freedom are allowed to be, be present. So again, the, the equations are you know, quite complicated, even the linear ones, but let me just outline sort of the, the, key, the key things. Okay, so now I'm not gonna write down this expression, but the, you know, the energy density in the matter field. So this W is the time derivative, but Hubble normalized. So this, the energy density in the matter is essentially just the time derivative plus the potential plus spatial gradients. So I mean, this, this might, so this, this I'm sorry, just because I'm, I am running out of time, I just want to kind of get to the end, and we're going to write down everything. But you know, energy in a scalar field is a sum of gradients plus potential. This is the time derivative, Hubble normalized, the Hubble normalized spatial gradients and the potential. So this is just the energy in the matter. Um, the energy in the shear part is, so this capital sigma is just the Hubble normalized little sigma I had before. So, and this one is just the, say one sixth. This is a pretty simple expression. It's just the, the square of the shear tensor, Hubble normalized shear tensor. And then you know, this thing is a complicated mess of everything else, but it turns out that this, in, mo in most cases of, that we're gonna be looking at, this is kind of irrelevant. The curvature doesn't matter, but it's not just a constant. There's a Everything else in the Einstein equations we just shove into this term. But these are kind of the two important ones. And actually this, this, this is not even that important in, these, in the fixed point solutions. And it's gonna turn out that it's actually gonna be more convenient. Oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so, so the, the way to sort of describe, a more convenient way to, to think about this. So this, this is a, a symmetric trace-free tensor. So in general, it's got three i. So it, you know, a symmetric ten, three dimension, three. It's effectively three-dimensional tensor. It's got three eigenvalues, but because it's trace-free, there are essentially only two independent eigenvalues. So, so let's sort of write the eigenvalues of sigma, like sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, but sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three is zero. And so it's really, they're only essentially two independent quantities and it's more useful then to consider these so-called sigma plus um, and sigma minus variables. Um, so essentially we eliminate you know, the sigma three and then we take these particular combinations of um, 
these two eigenvalues. Okay. And then, but, you know, for these, um, okay, so, so you do this analysis, you, you look for, for fixed points. So for a, a non-positive potential, so zero or negative, so for the, the positive case, there, there are other fixed points, but for a non-positive um, potential, there are two fixed points to the linearized one of, uh, one's actually a family, the Kasner solution is one, and the FRLW, let me just write, so they just call them fixed points. So they're two fixed points, um, or rel two relevant fixed points, let me see here. So when, one, one is when the potential is exactly zero, um, it's given by the following, sigma plus squared plus sigma minus squared is equal to one minus sixth. So essentially, it's one of the fixed points now I'm writing, I'm writing this constraint, what, what it evaluates to. Um, and essentially with the case when W is zero, that's just the Kasner, uh, the family of Kasner solutions. So this, this is sometimes called the Kasner circle. And that's perhaps an easier way to, to think of it. So in, in, instead of having P1, P2, P3, you know, because of this trace recondition, we can write it in terms of sigma plus and sigma minus. And then to, to be one of the Kasner solutions, W is zero, there's no scalar field, and you're sitting at one a point on this, this circle. So let me draw that, because that actually is kind of a useful way to see what's happening with this, the dynamics. Okay. So here's sigma minus, here's sigma plus. This is the unit circle, this is the Kasner circle. So any Kasner spacetime is, you know, if you pick your set of three subject to that condition, it's going to be somewhere on the circle. Um, interestingly, if you add matter, so if, with, you know, with, with a relevant scalar field, so if it scales, if it's got k greater than root six, uh, there's going to be a solution where there is some dynamics in the field, and that's essentially going to shrink the fixed points by a certain amount. So in that case, if you will, matter kind of, and that gets your question, I mean, can matter and Kasner sort of coexist? And yes, they can. And essentially, the matter effectively shrinks this, this, this effect of Kasner circle, Kasner matter-like circle. So this is sort of Kasner plus matter. That's that, that fixed, okay, fixed circle, <laughs> the circle of fixed points. So that's the one relevant one. And the second one, the other fixed point, when the potential is um, not zero, the only one is the FRW fixed point. FRLW. So that, in that case, it turns out that you know, both uh, and actually omega k is, is zero here as well. So this is Friedman Robertson, the major walker on this diagram. So in, for linear perturbations about you know, this class of backgrounds, there's a circle of fixed points and there's an FRW solution that's possible. Now, so it, it turns out that, okay, so there have been, but now we, we, we're treating both matter perturbations and general gravitational wave perturbations. Um, there's a field which also it can be written in terms Sorry, of the... can I ask you something? Yeah. So the FRW one is collapsed, uh, is m moving towards a singularity, or I'm yeah. rolling down this negative potential here. Now. Yeah, so this, so this is now pure Einstein gravity. So this is, this is going towards a big crunch. So this, this will have a, a big crunch singularity. So again, if, if you eventually want this to be a viable bouncing model at some point, you're going to have to introduce a, a new matter field that violates the null energy condition. So this, this analysis does not include 
any of that. So this is all approaching a big crunch. So if you're sitting at this, at this fixed point here, you'll run into a singularity. Okay. Okay, so you know, in in this you know this tetrad formulation, one uh, there's a there's a field that's um, essentially gives you the symmetric part of the connection associated with this tetrad. It's often you know, written by this ma this matrix N A B. It's also a symmetric matrix, so it has, it's got three eigenvalues, and this this is one one of the sort of variables in this formalism, which which represent gravitational wave degrees of freedom. And it turns out that it's the, this, this is the key gravi gravity degree of freedom that sort of causes this Kasner dynamics. So this thing has three eigenvalues, again, called n1, n2, n3. And on this Kasner circle, it turns out that, um, OK, I forget exactly. I'm not going to label this. because I'm there's this triangle that you do on top of it. And above this line, this N3 eigenvalue is unstable. So this, if there's a small amount of N3, this grows exponentially. If you're below this line, it decays exponentially. It's stable. So below this line, N1 is unstable. OK. And they sort of do it kind of like that. Here in this region, N1 is unstable. And in this region, sort of outside of this line, N2 is unstable. What's N alpha beta again? OK, th this is the, uh, it's the spatial uh, tetrad connection show part and its trace-free trace -free spatial part of the tetrad connection. So if, if you will, effectively, the Christoffel symbol. So in, but in a tetrad formulation, you've got the essentially Ricci rotation coefficients that you use to describe um, the Einstein equations. And so we can write the spatial part of the tetrad connection in terms of this spatial, effectively three-dimensional matrix, but it's trace-free, so it's got three eigenvalues. Um, and it turns out that it's, it's these eigenvalues that essentially are the key ones controlling this, this stability and this instability. So what this is kind of this, the, the qualitative picture here. Okay, so if, you, if you're sitting, let's say exactly Kasner. So if you're sitting exactly on a Kasner solution, of course, you're going to stay there forever. There's not going to be any of these bounces, but it's unstable. So as long as you add a little bit of N1, it turns out that this N1 is going to grow. And when it's going to grow, typically it's going to kick this to another. This is one of these bounces. So it, it kicks it to another point on this Kasner circle. Now on this part of the Kasner circle, N1 is stable, so it's going to decay. But here N3 is unstable. So here N3 was decaying, but now N3 is going to start growing. And eventually N3 is going to grow. It's going to kick it to another Kasner circle. And so you're going to have these bounces around on the Kasner circle. So kind of pictorially, it's like an incredibly messy picture now. The key things are we have the circle, and then we have these, this triangle that depicts which of these fields are unstable. But interestingly now, you can see that inside, let me, let me erase these bounces. Very confusing. OK, but right, so when we're outside of this triangle, there's at least one N1. But one of these Ns is unstable. OK, these are, these are kind of unusual points. But then they're not generic. But, if we're inside this circle, so if we can now add matter, so we shrink this circle, if we can add matter such that the circle is entirely within this triangle, then this kind of admixture of Kasner plus matter, so it's still an anisotropic solution, but this becomes stable. So if we're in this, if we can add matter such that we're in this circle, then this becomes stable. Okay, that, 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 okay that's one comment. But now the problem is if we don't have an, an, an ekpyrotic type potential. So, okay, it's a, it's a non-positive potential, but if it's not sufficiently steep, so if we don't satisfy that k equals zero condition, this FRW fixed point is unstable. So if we start with FRW, we've got a little perturbation, it will eventually jump, you know, okay, depending on what omega is, it might jump to one of these stable 
but anisotropic mixed points, or it will jump to a Kasner-like point, where, and then it will start undergoing this chaotic mix master. But it turns out if you add a potential, FRLW becomes stable, but this, this circle becomes unstable. And so, so that, that kind of flips the whole picture around. So even if you start in a universe where you've got significant anisotropy, because of the instabilities, they'll start bouncing around, but eventually you know, there'll, there'll be a bounce that will take it towards FRW. So this, this has sort of got a pretty large basin of attraction, if you will. So with a sufficiently steep scalar field potential, this becomes stable, this becomes unstable, and so there's a pretty large region of solution space, if you will, that will dynamically flow to FRW, um, and in a way which, again, it's independent of causality. These points are, this ultralocality is still holding, so they're not talking to each other, um, kind of independent of that. Oh, shit, I'm okay, I'm five minutes over, but let me just, kind of like five minutes just to show some examples. Um, so now, share screen. Oh, no, sorry, I have to... Share, share. Oh, just... Share. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, this is without the, the scalar field. Um, uh, sorry, I'm edit mode. Uh, okay, I would, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I, the, the, this is the this is the messy curvature piece that I didn't write down um, in in terms of these variables. Okay, so th this is a, a one dimensional. So not, not, it's a three dimensional for three plus one dimensional space time. I've got symmetries in y and z. So this is just in the x direction. And here this is so now we're starting with uh, initial conditions where there is there is this this egg pyrotic field, if you will, with a sufficiently steep potential. Um, this yellow is the matter density. There is actually a lot of curvature initially blue, and this is the shear tensor in pink. So this is a, a very anisotropic, inhomogeneous in one dimensional solution. But now you'll see as we evolve, there'll be a region of the space-time which is sufficiently close to this sort of stable fixed point in its basin of attraction that it's going to flow there. There will still be a part of the space-time which is actually outside of it and will keep undergoing these bounces. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, let me, okay. I, if, if I, it works on my laptop, so, if, so I apologize for that. Um, actually, I don't, think, I don't know if any of these are going to work then. But okay, so what happens is there's lots of dynamics. In a big part of the space-time, it evolves to omega matter is equal to one, omega curvature and omega is shear is equal to zero. Exactly this, this point. Um, is this gonna play? No, okay, sorry. I guess I should have connected my laptop instead of that, but I don't know why I didn't copy it over. But okay. Um, yeah, let me, or, you know, if, or, or, or how about, let me, if there's time at the very end, I can show these animations, but I can just, just kind of describe what happens. It's not, it is the very end. right, I mean, after, oh, is Blake not going to be, uh, is there another lecture now? No, no. Oh, but then, then I'm taking your break time. So let me, let me get that. <laughs> you know, this might, might be complicated to get itself. So let me just say, okay, so most of the universe smooths. There's a, there's a portion that doesn't, but if we actually look at the proper volume of that portion, um, it, sh it shrinks exponentially relative to the volume uh, of the part that isn't smooth. So, you know, if the, starting with very anisotropic, inhomogeneous initial conditions, the majority of the universe smooths, there, are, there is still a little bit that undergoes this chaotic mixed master dynamics, but it's essentially, um, as you approach the, the, the big crunch, it becomes exponentially uh, small in terms of volume. Um, yeah, I think that, that's basically all that I wanted to say with these things. So yeah. sorry for going over, and um, yeah, thanks for your time. <laughs>